I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles this morning and go with me to the book of Revelation in chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8 this morning. The book of Revelation makes up a catalog of things that are going to occur in the tribulation. The Bible teaches us that God is always to be found faithful. And when you look at the point that is before us, just really constantly being brought home to our hearts in the book of Revelation, you realize that there are two things really going on here. One is an altar call. God is actually giving an invitation to the world to get saved before it's literally and eternally too late. People who live on this earth today are overwhelmed with a sense of self-importance and uh, hyperactivity. makes it very difficult for people to really hear the still small voice of the Lord God when He speaks to them. Uh, it has occurred to me in recent days that we live our lives in such a way as to go through life from cradle to grave with our feet never hitting the ground. And when we finally do find our feet hitting the ground, it will be right at the threshold of a, of a grave. And then we stumble into it and into eternity. I don't want that to happen to people I know, people I see. And I think we need to go back to our moorings. And that means sharing our faith. God cares about the world. He loved the world so much He gave His only begotten Son. And so when we come to chapter 8, I want you and me to remember something. It is an invitational. God is giving an invitation to the entire world. In fact, chapter 7 told us that multitudes come out of great tribulation because God had given them an invitation. And what we're seeing now in chapter 8 is a second phase to what we might call a three-phase unfolding of God uh, and His efforts, of God's efforts in the midst of this world. But I said there were two things He's doing. One is He's given an invitation to the world. The other thing that He is doing is He's reclaiming the chosen people of Israel. And what is really cool about that is that because we see God working with this nation in such a way as to go to such great lengths, not only to reclaim and redeem them and restore them, but also to establish them in such a powerful way so as to make all of the nonsense of the Old Testament that you and I roll our eyes over, how could they, how could they, how could they, have been so unbelieving, seeing the Red Sea, seeing the fire and the cloud and all those things. We're, we're going to forget that because God's going to restore them in such a way as to make them so lit up for Jesus that throughout the millennial kingdom, uh, all will be forgotten about the wanderings that they had to endure and that God put up with from them. Now, my point is this. They are a nation and God doesn't give up on them. And I want you to know that they represent for you and me the emblematic truth that he will never give up on you. That is huge. You may be wandering around in your own little wilderness. You may be struggling and stumbling. You may be questioning the heavens. But God never gives up on His children. I am just so glad that's true. Because if we could lose this salvation, we would lose it. And what we see is God's going after His people, and He will come after you. He never gives up. You as His child, once born again, can never be unborn. What I want to remind us of, just in short, is that in chapter 6, we saw the seals of a scroll that was presented to us in chapter 5. And a seal, we saw seals on that scroll, seven in number. Six were unfolded for us in chapter 6. Then there was a parenthetical insert where God says, listen, I know this sounds awful, and it is indeed going to be awful. But I have a plan of redemption that is unfolding even while those terrible things are happening on the earth. And he said what, I, what John saw in chapter 7 was that there were 144,000 Jewish evangelists who were sealed so that nothing could harm them or stop them in their efforts to get the Word of God out. 
And then we saw in the second half of chapter 7, a great multitude coming out of the great tribulation. We equate them with the Nephanim, who were like those in the days of Joshua when they came in to take over the promised land. Uh, the Nephanim were those who were making up those Gibeonites who came and pretended they came from a far land, and they said, you know, let us make a league with you. And after they, Joshua found out that it was a ruse to really save themselves from the destruction that faith had conjured in their heart was inevitable for them, after they saw the walls of Jericho fall down, they figured, we're in big, big trouble. So they made this league, and just like that, many of those in the tribulational time will come and fall before God and say, we're sorry, and many of them will be saved. They will be saved, but that does not mean they will be safe. Even as you may be saved and you're not safe, but in their day, the safety issue is going to be a lot bigger. <laughs> Because there's going to be scorching, there's going to be thirst, there's going to be famine, there's going to be people after them with sword unsheathed to take their heads from their bodies. People who are lost during that time will, in fact, have to endure great hardship. In fact, we see them at the end of chapter 7 with the Lamb. And the Bible says that when they're with Him in verse 16 of chapter 7, they shall hunger no more. They shall thirst no more. The light of the sun, uh, the, neither shall the sun light on them anymore, nor any heat, meaning they're going to be scorched with the same sun, uh, smitten with the same plagues of famine, and so forth. It's going to be hard for those in the tribulation who get saved, but these are they who come out of great tribulation nevertheless. And they represent in the Old Testament, or actually the Old Testament represents for us in shadowy form what these guys represent us for us in the end of days. People who are spared from a sword that was inevitably going to have to come because they made their peace with the God who reigns in heaven. We saw six seals that were broken in chapter 6. The seventh seal was tarried for because he wanted us to know salvation was still going to be presented and available. In chapter 8 and verse 1, the Bible says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, you might underline the word seventh seal, because chapter 7 represents for us a parenthetical insert. A parenthetical insert that we will see happen over and again. God will move the chronology forward and then he will tarry and tell us some backstory. Then he will move the chronology forward and tarry and tell us some backstory. It is the way of this book. It is an orderly book and it is in order. When the Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 8, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. But I want you to know something about this silence in heaven. There's something in verses 1 and 2 that really bring to us a little bit more illumination on what we've already seen. The Bible says that when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now, when you see that word half an hour, you know, it's like you think in terms of eternal time. Is there even time? And I'm thinking, not really. And yet, you have to ask yourself, what does this represent for us? Well, I have suggested in past uh, messages that that six seals of chapter six uh, were representing a really breakneck, breakneck layout of the first three and a half years of the tribulation. An Antichrist arises, war breaks out. Subsequently, there's famine. And finally, there is a lot of death going on in anarchy. Then there are martyrs underneath an altar and then finally a great earthquake and people crying out and saying, fall on us to the mountains because the great day of his wrath, the wrath of the Lamb has come. Those are the first six seals. I believe they are representative for us of the first half of the tribulation. And when it says half, I think there's a little bit of a clue there that indeed it is half. I'll give you a little more uh, on that. Go back to chapter 3 in Revelation. The Bible actually brings before us a couple things that have to do with this word hour. The word hour shows up ten times in the book of Revelation. The first two times are in chapter 3. And it's interesting because the first time it shows up is in regard to the church at Sardis. Or the church in Sardis. Now, church in Sardis was the Reformation Church. They had a reputation that they were alive and yet they were dead. You may know that uh, the uh, 31st of this month is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. 
And that means that is the 500th anniversary of the day that the 95 theses were pounded to the Wittenberg door and Luther wanted debate on some huge issues, 95 in number. And subsequently, we see them born out of the fires of understanding of what is right and wrong. Luther takes a torch that others had kind of tried to move down the field, and he takes it beyond what anybody thought could happen. With the printing press in vogue and with him as inside the Catholic Church, he wasn't fighting from the outside in. He was inside, and he was able to create a great deal of dialogue. And yet, nevertheless, it's almost as if the Reformation died as it fell out of the out of the out of the birthing uh, room. Uh, he says, you have, an, uh, you have a reputation that you are alive, but you're dead in verse 1 of chapter 3. But the Bible says in verse 3 of chapter 3, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Because they forgot how they had received. And that was by the word of God, and having that as their authority. And he says, hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come quickly or I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now, when he says, come upon you as a thief, you connect that to 2 Thessalonians, uh, and, or 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5, where the Bible says that he comes upon the world as a thief. And so we see he's talking about that tribulation time by the connection with the word thief and the word hour. An entire hour is coming upon the world. And for half an hour, it's quiet. Now, that's the Sardis church. Then you have the Philadelphian church in the same chapter, and these guys had it completely correct as far as God was concerned. They were lit up with an open door that no man could shut. They were the church of the Great Awakenings period back in the 17 and 1800s across England, across America. Revivals broke out. There were so many people coming to hear the Word of God uh, that they had no buildings uh, for many of those meetings, and they had to have open-air meetings. And as a result of that, the Bible tells us of these uh, people in that time frame, in verse 10, God promises them, He gives them no reproof, no call to repent, because they're doing what they should be doing, and what they're doing is they're witnessing. They have an open door. Paul said, I walked away from an open door, and yet God leads me in triumph wherever I go. And I went one place, and God was there too. And he says here, he says in verse 10, Because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour. See that? The word hour. The hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the earth to try them that dwell upon the earth. He's talking about the hour. So if we suggest, if as I suggest, the hour represents the entire tribulational period. He calls it the hour of temptation. He ca talks about it as a thief coming in, this, in an hour. And then we see in chapter 8 and verse 1 that he's, there's going to be silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour. I want to suggest in the continuum that in chapter 6 we had six seals breaking that were broken as God literally Remove the church, remove the restrainer of the Holy Spirit who dwelt in the church, and now allowed the world naturally to have what it wanted. And what it wanted was it wanted a global government. Do you see that on your horizon today? The world wants globalism, they want one world government, they want no borders. They want one currency. In fact, they want no currency. They want to do away with currency altogether. And so when it says that there was uh, silence in heaven for about a half an hour, to me that speaks of the idea that those first three and a half years represent for us what unfolds naturally. Because when you have a person trying to vie for the top of the heap in the political realms, there's going to be bloodletting. If you have Europe uh, becoming more prominent and you have America more diminished and you have the, uh, uh, the, the rapture of people out of the world and you have a, a, an opportunity presented to many who are insidiously already prepared to uh, take uh, the control of those reins of this world because the devil doesn't know when the rapture is coming. He has to always have somebody ready. And so you have all these people, and then you have people in Europe trying to do their thing. But you've got China over here. You've got Russia over here. You've got Europe over here. You've got people who don't like it. You've got the, 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 the nations that are represented down in the continent of Africa. And you're going to see, if you would go back in, uh, in Daniel chapter 11, there's wars that happen. The Antichrist sets up a tent right there, a tabernacle right there in Israel to take it down. And some other kings come against them. And so there's war. 
And that war brings forth famine because when you have war, you begin to naturally destroy people's lands and their homes and their buildings. And subsequently, you have death because when everything comes apart, then there's looting and there's killing and there's murder. And so I believe all that stuff is natural. And God has just basically withdrawn for three and a half years. And what we're looking at now in chapter 8 is this, the beginning of the second half of the tribulation. I would not die on this hill, but it makes sense to my sensibilities as I look at those, those particulars of that hour being put here as being silent for half an hour. It's like God's been quiet for half an hour. In verse 2 it says, And I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them was given seven trumpets. It's as if he says, Listen, I've been silent for the first half. Now we're going to start suiting up. We're going to start suiting up. And he gets these angels and they have trumpets, and they're, they're not there to worship. You know, trumpets have two things uh, that they represent in Scripture. One is war and one is worship. <laughs> Sometimes the trumpets were blown in worship, and they worshiped the Lord. And they, you know, David himself designated certain people to blow trumpets. But here we have more of a connectivity to the book, uh, to the book of Joshua, where we see Jericho uh, come to the fore. You remember when the Lord told them to walk around the city of Jericho seven days, once a day for seven days, and on the seventh day, walk around it for seven times. And then at the end of the seventh time around, blow the trumpets and the walls will fall down. The Bible talks about a trumpet in, in 1 Corinthians in chapter 13 in that great love tra chapter. It says if a, if a trumpet gives an uncertain sound, uh, who will know to assemble? So these trumpets here represent for us the assembling of God's, uh, God's uh, armies. You know, we, 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 we understand, right? He is the Lord of hosts. <laughs> That's what He is. He's the Lord of armies. We see it all over in the Old Testament. We see 800,000 uh, Assyrians being killed in one night as a, one angel goes through a city uh, or outside the city as they're outside Jerusalem. And he slays 800 or 800,000 uh, or 850,000 people right there. Those, all those soldiers that were killed and those that were remnants that remained woke up in the morning and everybody around them was dead because God can we hear David being told, you're going to do this battle differently when you hear a going in the trees. Then you get up and you go. Because <laughs> going in the trees was the Lord going before them. I'm so glad I'm on the right side of this thing. <laughs> Think with me of Elisha as he's sitting there at, the, uh, uh, at some little city on the outskirts of some city. And all of a sudden his, his, his servant gets up and he says, hey man, did you see all those armies out there? And he says, don't worry, more are they with us than they, are with the, than they, than they that are with them. Huh? And I'm just so glad I'm on the right side of this. And God has presented Himself as the meek and lowly Jesus, but He's also the mighty conquering King. And He's beginning to get ready to come back. And He's going to set His angels uh, into the fray now. It says he gave them all trumpets. These seven angels, he gave them trumpets. Why seven? Because there are seven movements that are going to unfold in the next two chapters. And the Bible says in verse uh, 3, it says, And another angel came, and he stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was set before the throne. Now, when you kind of look at the chronology of this book, you also have to remember that in chapter 6, that there was an altar there. And under that altar were the martyrs. And those martyrs said, How long, Lord, till you, you know, get vengeance, reckon vengeance upon those who took our lives? And it was given unto them white robes, and they were told to wait for a little while until others had given their testimony as they had given their own. Well, so we see this altar being brought back into the view, back into view. And as we see this altar, this altar is represented as having an angel there who stood at this altar, and this angel had a golden censer. Now, when you see this stuff, remember what we said at the outset. It's very difficult to understand the book of Revelation unless you understand the entire first 65 books of the Bible. So much is there. If you were to go back and read the book of Leviticus, you would probably just be overwhelmed by the detail with which it sets forth the worship that took place in the temple, a tabernacle and temple, and how the priests were supposed to do certain things. But what I want you to recognize here is, is that this is a specifically real 
uh, rendition of which the Old Testament temple worship was a shadow. So in the Old Testament, those guys did things. They didn't even know why they were doing them. They were just doing them because God said, here's what Moses gave us. This is what we have to do. And they were going through motions they did not understand. That's very important for you and me because sometimes we have to do things we don't understand. Sometimes we have to take it on the chin, sometimes in ways we don't understand. Paul himself had a thorn in the flesh, you recall, and he asked the Lord three times to remove it. And the Lord answered him and says, Listen, my grace is sufficient for thee in thy weakness. My strength is made, uh, I, am, I am made strong. And he said, I will therefore, you know, glory in my infirmities. And sometimes we have a hard time with that. We want it all to go smooth and sailing and everything get the, everything the way we want it. But these guys in the Old Testament were having to go through motions they didn't even understand. And when you and I go through hard times, we have to do what God wants us to do even still. You have to put a smile on and you have to go back into the world. You have to get your smile on. You have to go in there and witness. You have to get your smile on and you have to lay everything down at the altar and say, God, you're God, I'm not. I'm not going to be mad at you anymore. I'm going to love on you in spite of my circumstances. And beloved, this is America and that's hard for us to hear. But if I were talking to a group of people in China, if I were talking to a group, group of people in North Korea, if I were talking to a group of people in some persecuted Islamic state, they would lean in and say, okay, I see what I need to do now. Now. But you and I, we tend to think we need to get it easy, and that is a problem for us. Prosperity has no worked in uh, humbling agent. We forget to be humble. But those who are in deep poverty and impoverishment and are persecuted, they understand the realities that the Jews had to go through. They went through motions, and those motions were done in the dark. They didn't know why. They just did them. You and I need to learn that. We would tell our children, you just need to do it because I said so. And if God said so, we just need to do it. Amen? Can I get an amen? Amen. That's what we just need to do what He says. Because we don't know what we're doing or why we're doing it, but God does. So what we have here is we have this angel at the, at the altar. There was an altar in the temple and there's an altar in heaven. The heavenly altar is the substantial real. And the uh, tabernacle and temple altars, they were uh, shadowy and they were foreshadows of what was up ahead in the, in the heavens, up in the heavens. And they had a golden censer. And if you've ever been to, say, a Romanesque kind of a church where they have the, uh, a funeral or something, they'll have a censer and they'll be waving it and there'll be a little smoke coming out. And what will happen is, is they will go around maybe a coffin and say some prayers, usually in Latin, oftentimes in Latin. But that's not what this is. That's what they picked up and said, well, we'll do these real fascinating pageantry type centered things too. But in the heavens, this is real. And what was in the censer? Well, many times it was incense. That's why it's called a censer. They would take some of the incense and they would wave it around. And what we understand is that the sense, uh, the incense that is there, not only is there a golden censer, but the Bible says, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne of God. Now, if you understand the layout of the tabernacle, what you would find is you would have this great curtain, if you will, a great curtain that divided the front from the back, the holy of holies from the from the uh, holy place from the most to, from the most holy place, and they would put a, an altar of incense right in front of that curtain, and it was a picture of our prayers making it inside of the throne room of God. When you pray, your prayers, you desire for them to go right into the throne room. And God takes great pleasure in that. And this is what was emblematic, in, uh, emblematically signified in that golden censer in the tabernacle. But in reality, God does take our prayers seriously. And here he says that this angel had to be given much incense. Not just a little bit, not just some. He says he has to be given much to give it, uh, to offer it with the prayers of the saints. When I drill into that in my mind, I think, what is it that you and I are told to pray for? Uh, And and then what what do we pray for? (laughs) Okay. What do we find we most often pray for? Health, uh, prosperity, a job, a mate. And those things are fine. God would have us, you know, bring all, cast all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. However, when the disciples asked, teach us to, ask the Lord to teach us to pray, He said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, 
which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Listen, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, not everything else, but my point is right there out of the gate. What? How often do we pray your kingdom come? And what he's having to do is bolster the prayers, perhaps on that note. It has been suggested that when Rome married the state and the church together in the early uh, 4th century, under Constantine, that the believers lost their blessed hope. When they were persecuted, all they thought about was heaven. But when they were brought into positions of affluence and they got a, a golden goblet and they got a really cushiony sh chair to sit in and they got honor from kings and those under the king and when they began to have influence and then when they began to have affluence, they lost their second or they, they, they lost their, their, their blessed hope. America is under the same kind of, uh, uh, of influence. Because what we have is each of us reigns as kings. We can choose to listen to God and we can choose not to listen to God. Every one of us der derives uh, uh, the uh, opportunity to draw near and say, who do I want to listen to? You know it's a weird day today, right? You can listen to CNN and Fox. You can get on the internet and you can find good sources of news where they're really telling you what's going on. Or you can be content to go out there and listen to all of the ones that tell you just what you want to hear. And what I'm finding, even in my journeys, as I go into a workplace with men, I hear them echoing back every word that those who are on the side of the delusion, uh, echoing it all back. That we ought to open the borders. I'm talking men who, if it happened, they would be under attack themselves. They don't see the long game. And I'm seeing men taking that as their, their, their narrative for their lives. We should open the borders. We should let people in. We shouldn't have any... Uh, we should feel terrible if we don't let people come in illegally and unvetted. And after all, we took the earth, we took America, and we're, we're criminals in our own right. I mean, it's under the current all over the place. Because why? Because people have chosen what they will listen to. And there's a lot of choices on the wrong side. The Bible says in chapter 18, we will see later of Revelation, that outside of heaven are dogs and sorcerers, which are drug users and drug dealers, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Whoever loves lies and makes lies. You know, our world's in a big lie spinning business today, isn't it? And we have to be careful to get the clear truth and there are ways to do that. But you choose who you're going to listen to. You choose what counselors you bring into your throne room. Every time you click that, that button on your clicker, you're going to let people come in and entertain you. You're going to let people come in and tell you what's going on. You're going to let people... And if you have not got a clear word from God on issues of the day in which we live, you can be blown by every wind that's out there to go hither and yon. The problem with the Israelites was they were constantly influenced by what we would call an east wind, what the Bible calls an east wind. That was the Babylonian wind. It kept blowing on Israel. And they kept saying, we want to be like them. We want to make them our friends. And eventually they were the ones that came and carried them away. And it's an east wind. And today we have an east wind as well. We want to be like the Near East, which would be Europe, and the Middle East, which would be those Islamic, and the Far East. We want to be, you know, just like everybody else. We want to get together. We're influenced by a wind. Verse 3 tells us that he offered incense with the incense that the prayers of the saints had offered up. And the Bible says that this, these, this incense was to go up on the golden altar which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came up with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So you have this angel, and this angel offers incense of the saints as well as incense that God had helped him with. You recall, perhaps in the book of Romans in chapter 8, that the Bible says that when we pray, sometimes with groanings that can't be uttered, that the Holy Spirit helps us in our infirmity and, and prays for us. Because sometimes we know not how to pray as we ought. And so what we're seeing here is that culmination of the, of the prayers of the saints with the helper, uh, helper prayers of the Holy Spirit. They're all put here, brought to bear. And if you remember that Lord's model prayer, it's the, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Those things can, can converge here. 
You recall in chapter 4 and chapter 5 that in heaven and on earth and under the earth, everybody's saying, you are worthy to take unto you these things. Go ahead and do it. Here it is. It's now coming up in incense. It's a sweet savor to God. He's pleased to hear it. He's pleased to receive it. And the Bible says in verse 4, it says, And the smoke of the incense came up with the prayers of the saints and ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And in verse 5 it says, And the angel took the censer, he filled it with fire of the altar, and he cast it into the earth, and there were voices voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. I remember when I was a little kid and I was in my... I, 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 I always had my halo on. I was a good boy. I was. Uh, but sometimes I wasn't. And I remember one time I got some new shoes and I was out playing by the creek out back behind the houses across the street. And I jumped across that creek in my new shoes and my foot literally went right down in the mud up to my ankle. <laughs> made that kind of sound when I pulled it out. It made a popping sound when I pulled it out. It was so bad. And those shoes were covered with mud. And I had to go home with brand new shoes covered in mud. I do not even remember my mother. I just know that she knew I was in trouble. I knew I was in trouble. And it was like, <gasps> and I was in trouble. The world's in trouble right here. Thunderings, lightnings, voices. You can hear everybody taking a gasp. <sighs> Fire and incense. And then it says voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. Why? Because what's happening here is heaven is entering the fray. Antichrist has been allowed to ride upon a white horse. God says that's a motion of the world. The black horse, there's war. The, or the red horse, there's war. The black horse, there's death. The pale horse, there's famine and, and death and hell coming. And, and you have all of these things unfolding. But that's all natural calamity. What we now have is we have supernatural calamity. Because God is going to do some stuff literally showing that He has now entered the fray. But do not miss this connection. Do not miss this connection. That altar we see elsewhere in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah in chapter 6. The Bible says that Isaiah... Uh, was there, and Uzziah had passed away, who was a good king. And it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. High and lifted up, and the glory of his train filled the temple. And there were six angels, uh, there were angels before him saying, holy, holy, holy. They had six wings, two they flew, two they covered their faces, two they covered their feet. They ceased not day or night saying, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is filled with thy glory. And the Bible says, when Isaiah saw this lofty and awesome sight, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am an, a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. He literally saw himself. But what's interesting is that the Lord turned around, sent an angel over to take some coals from the altar, and bring it over to Isaiah and purge his sin from the altar to purge his sin. So don't miss the connection of what God's really doing. It's an invitation. It's a preparation. It's a restitution. And what we have is God is throwing altar fire from the altar on the earth, really in one sense to fulfill what was written in the book of Daniel. You remember Daniel was all concerned about what was going on after 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, uh, Daniel is told, listen, Daniel, you're worried. I know the people aren't ready to go back, but I, Gabriel, am sent to tell you this. Verse 24 of Daniel 9 says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Listen to this. Upon thy people and thy holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make a reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. That's the program. And he's taking coals from an altar that is going to purge the sins of this world. Isn't that cool? i just got to tell you. We're looking for that. That he's going to make Israel right with him. 
He's going to eclipse the nonsensical behaviors of their old world, their old generations, and He's going to bring in everlasting righteousness, and Israel's going to be restored. He's going to purge their iniquity. He's going to make an end of transgression. He's going to get them on board with Him 100%. 144,000 Jewish evangelists in chapter 7, and now throughout the end of this tribulation, and what we would call the, what we, which we would call the Great Tribulation period, he's going to bring these people uh, up close and personal to himself, and this, this purging that will take place as a result of this fire and so forth being brought down is going to open their eyes wide open. I know there have been times when I was a little boy again, and I was very, very scared. I remember my parents when I was little. I was probably eight or nine. They took me to see the movie, The Night of the Living Dead. I was nine years old. I, this borders on child abuse because I am sitting there. My eyes were wide open and I'm like, what? Literally, I got home that night. I could not sleep because if you crawled up on my bed and you looked out on my backyard, it looked just like the black and white movie I had just seen. And I was scared. And what God is going to do at this time of great tribulation is He's going to open their eyes wide and they're going to see Him whom they pierced, ultimately. But they're going to know it's Him by the things that are going to transpire hereafter. So what we've seen thus far is the significance of this hour. We've seen that there is a half an hour where it's, he's been silent. We've seen that there is an altar that is significant in many levels and that there's a purging that's going to go on in these first few verses it talks about because that is what he did with that altar in the past. It's what he said he would do in Daniel 9 and it's what he's going to do as he begins to test the world by virtue of all of the calamities that will come. So we've seen the significance of the hour. Let's see the substance of the hour. Verse 7, or verse 6 says, And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. Wow, what a cool day that's going to be. <laughs> Things are going to start unfolding again very, very quickly. Because what you have to understand is there's not only seven, uh, seven trumpets, but there are also seven bold judgments that are going to come. Uh, and what we're going to see here is we're going to see some supernatural occurrences taking place. The Bible says the first angel sounded in verse 7, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and there was cast upon the earth, and, and they were cast upon the earth, and a third part of the trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. This is a big deal. But it's not just a big deal. We're talking a third of the trees... We're talking a third of the grass. You know, I'm telling you, that's a lot of trees. That's a lot. Have you ever driven across some of these, these states like the Virginia, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania? Trees everywhere. One third are going to be wiped out, and God's the one that's going to do it. So when you talk about the environmental movement of our day, they're going to have more of an issue with him than with anybody. <laughs> I think it was Charlie that told me not long ago, he said, you know, this, this wildfire problem they got out there in, in uh, California, part of the reason that that is a problem out there is because the environmentalists would not let them timber the state parks, the national parks. And so when a fire started, it created a, a little bit of a tinderbox. And, and it's because the nonsensical behaviors of man brought forth the catastrophic uh, outcomes. Well, God is going to destroy one-third of the, the green grass, one-third of the trees. But what is significant here to notice as well is, is that it is fire and hail and, and it's mingled with blood. And it, answered, it answers deliberately to the book of Exodus. Because it was in the book of Exodus that we find these plagues are echoed from... Because in the book of Exodus, the Bible tells us that there was a, a, a plague in Exodus chapter 9 and verse 24. And it was a plague where hail and fire fell down and it destroyed anybody who was out in the midst of the field. So the mingled with blood thing came from the animals and men who were outside when this fire and uh, hail fell down upon Egypt in that day. And so this is a, 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 a reminder. <laughs> we got hail, we got fire, and we've got it mingled with blood in verse 7. Remember Israel. Remember world. People who had the Bible stories, the ten plagues. This 
is a revisitation of that. So you will know who I am. So you will know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I find it fascinating when people cannot get their minds around, and of course we all forget, but as a believer I see it periodically. I poke through this shadow lands and I realize I'm moving, uh, I'm moving stuff from one place to another. All the time. I mean, you get one of those time-lapse photos, right? It's like on a work site. You see men moving around. It's like crazy. It, that's our lives. You're moving the, the trash can to the curb, moving the trash can to the hack, you know. You're moving the furniture around. You know, you're, you're getting new siding, and you're throwing the old siding away, and then you're going to the store, and you're coming back from the store, and you're going to the store, and you're coming back, and you're going around the same circle. My point is this. You and I have absolutely nothing down here that abides. It's God's. And that means that when the world in which the lost man finds himself is utilized and he begins to think of himself as owning the things that he has possession of at the moment, he needs to remind himself that the earth is the Lord's and he is an interloper. That he is taking the things that God has made and he's using them to satisfy himself as if he had a right to do so. The lack of humility is staggering when people do not realize there's a God who owns it all. And so what God is doing in these plagues is He's letting everybody know, by the way, that's mine. That tree, that grass, that beauty, it's mine. And I can take it away. I won't take it all away. I'm going to take a third of it away in a hurry so you'll know it is mine. All souls are mine, the Bible says. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The Bible says he, has, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And so he does. He begins to enter the fray. First trumpet is green grass. Now that's going to be a problem because we understand that the blood and all of that and the mingling of that, we know it's not just going to hit grass, a third of the grass, a third of the trees, but there's going to be a whole lot of crops wiped out. So God is ramping up the famine problem, people are down there. Remember chapter 6? At the end it says they were thirsty, they would thirst no more, they would hunger no more. Actually, chapter 7, at the end of chapter 7, that they would no more thirst, no more hunger. We've got the green grass, we've got the trees gone. And then it says in verse 8, And then the second angel sounded, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Remember that? If we miss the first connection, the second one is almost unmistakable. When Pharaoh was uh, belligerent, and he was uh, obstinate, and he was resistant and rebellious, and he had, uh, had an opportunity to let the people go and worship, he said, uh, No. <laughs> And the Bible tells us that he was told that he would, uh, by Moses, that Moses would turn the water to blood. He told him he would do it before he did it. This is what prophecy, this is one of those prophecies, you don't think it's a prophecy. It's a prophecy. He says, well, then I'm going to turn the water to blood. <laughs> and the fish are going to stink and you're going to be, it's going to be odious to you. Because why? Because, is, because Pharaoh thought, that river is mine. He said, I, am I not a god? Have I not taken this river, Nile, and I've put these waterways into the inland and created a fertile place? Look what I have done. And God says, just watch. That's mine. You've manipulated some dirt, but that water's mine. And he touched the water and he turned it to blood. He says, this is something you need to remember. And by the way, that would be uh, in Exodus chapter 7 and verse 17 and following. You see, if you were to look at these and alliterate them, you would see, first of all, burning. Burning because fire and hail are coming down. Now we see a blockade because what are you doing? If you're going to take a land, that title deed was the title deed to the earth. He's going to come and he's going to put a foot on the right, uh, on the land and on the sea. He's going to take back the earth. He's going to be King Jesus. He's coming again. That's going to be cool because we will be coming with him. And that title deed means that as he begins to throw all of these things from the heavens to the earth, it's in preparation of overtaking the earth and reclaiming the earth. And subsequently, the whole earth will know it's Him when He arrives. 
So we would have, if you're going to occupy the place, you start breaking off the supplies to the world. If you have a, a kingdom that you're going to have a, lay a siege to, you might stop all of the, the, the good stuff coming in. You know, they would stop up rivers and say, no water's going in that city. They're going to get thirsty and hungry, and eventually they'll come out and throw themselves to us for mercy. So God turns the water off. He turns it to blood here at this point. And this is the sea. He'll get to the fresh water. But the sea, because this is a blockade, because what it is doing is it's not just turning the sea to blood, but it says a third part of the uh, creatures of the sea uh, were killed. And, and, and then a third part of the ships were destroyed. That's the shipping world. You know, these people, you know, we all depend on ships, right? We get your ships and you got your trucks and all. But this is knocking down all of the, all of the free flow of supplies and help. You know, we quickly go into Katrina. We quickly go into, uh, into these two latest ones, Irma and Harvey. We go in there right now, man. Let's, but if you got nobody, you got nobody. And you're in there with your own head, your own thoughts, and you're thinking how scared you are. And what do God people would think about that more often, about what the vulnerability is that is theirs? So God has burning. He sent burning on the earth. Third of the, the, um, the green. He sent blood on the earth, or uh, if we would more, a blockade, because he's basically turning off their free flow of access to help. Uh, verse 10 says, And the third angel sounded, and there was a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, which literally means undrinkable. Third part of the waters became Wormwood, and a third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So understand. God has set up a burning. He's wiped out a third part of the green. He set up a blockade. They, they, they can't get supplies and the fish stench would be coming into the world. Uh, and then thirdly, he sends bitterness. And this bitterness that he sends is a bitterness of the waters. And again, this answers to times in the Old Testament where waters were made bitter and people could not drink. And the Bible says uh, that there is coming this this this. Part of this is here, but there's going to be more later in chapter 12, which we will get to later. But this bitterness is a huge deal because God's world, it's His water. It's His air. You know, we all are sitting here right now, and we have a, a miracle going on every couple of seconds or every second or so. It's a little spark right in your chest. It's a little tiny little spark right now, right in your chest. It's not your spark. You have no power over that spark. It's God's spark. And the moment he says, I'm taking the spark away, we hit the ground. You see, we live upon a thin line, what was once referenced by Jonathan Edwards in his great sermon, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That we live in slippery places, the passage he takes. And he says it's as if God hangs the man who is lost over the abyss of eternal damnation. And he has him between finger and thumb. And all he has to do with every propagation, all he would have to do is just simply open those two fingers and allow them to perish. They provoke every moment. The Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. It says, do you not know that while you were yet enemies... God made peace through the blood of His cross in Ephesians. While we were enemies, He made peace. We were enemies. Oh, I, people tell you, and I've talked to these guys. I was brought that up this week with the guy. I talked to him about it. I said, you know, we're, we're enemies. He said, well, I'm not an enemy. I, I think he's all right. I just don't really know what to do with it. I don't want to do it. I said, no, everything we've ever done has influenced somebody else. And our sin makes us more culpable than ever. Our children, our wives, our husbands, our neighbors, our moms, our dads, we bump, we bump, we bump, we bruise, we trip up, we scandalize. And if it weren't for the grace of God, all of us would be damned. And he's reminding them here that the water is his, the spark is his, life is his. And the Bible says that they were many men died from the waters that became bitter. Verse 12 says, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars, so that the third part of them were darkened, and the day was shown not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Now what you're seeing here is we're seeing blackness. 
blackness. We recall that there came a great darkness for about three days on Pharaoh's throne. Nobody moved. It was like they couldn't move. This is in the plague. So again, he's saying, remember and realize this is me now. You've had your Antichrist. You've had your wars and your famine and your death and your anarchy and your murder and your beast rising up and now I'm going to turn the lights out. Nothing worse than having terrified yourself for three and a half years and all of a sudden we're going to turn the lights out? You mean I can't even see if it's coming? And some animals are nocturnal. They can see in the dark. So you're really vulnerable. But blackness came upon Egypt. And subsequently, uh, they would not be able to move at all. Now, could it be a volcano? Could it be the Yellowstone, the fallout of many volcanoes? We don't know. We do know this, however. It has precedence in Scripture. And the things that were written uh, uh, by the prophets, by Moses in the books of, of Exodus and so forth, uh, and the references of the Psalms, these people were writing historical truths, and if it would have not been true, it would have been refuted on the scene. And what we have now is blackness. And every little child that has learned about the ten plagues will remember the darkness, whether they want to or not, and they will be alone with their own thoughts. Now, when I read this, it reminded me of what David said in the book of Psalms. And I love this. Go with me quickly to Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is that passage we talk about how he knit us together in our mother's wombs and so forth. And David is just reveling in the fact that we are fearfully and we are wonderfully made. But it's more than just being wonderfully and fearfully and wonderfully made. We are loved we are loved very deliberately. David said, you know, in verse 7 of chapter of Psalm 139, it says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take my wings, the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand hold me. David is saying, you're everywhere, God. You are omnipresent. But look at this. In verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me. Look at this. Even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Why is that pertinent? Because those people in the tribulation are still in reach of mercy. Within reach of mercy. There is darkness. It's time to think. It's time to do an evaluation. It's time to take an inventory. It's funny how it is if we're in a foxhole on a battlefield in a foreign field, suddenly we're thinking pretty clearly about heaven and hell and eternity. If we've got a terrible diagnosis, we're thinking pretty clearly about the issues of eternity. God does these plagues of the fire from heaven and the, and the bitterness and the blood and the blockade. And now he gives them blackness and he says, now just sit there and think about that. Did you ever have your parents tell you that? Give them a little spanking and set them over in the corner. You just sit there and think about what you were learning right now. And I'm telling you, God is disciplining people to a place where they can repent. Because God is not willing that any should perish. He does not rejoice in the death of the wicked. Ecclesi or Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 11 says this, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why, why will you die? Turn ye, turn ye. People today, in the church and outside the church, many times have no clue of how serious all this is. And when we read a passage like that in Ezekiel, we almost sense the emotional connection God has to the lost person. Turn ye, turn ye. It's a begging. Can you imagine the condescension of a holy God who did all that He's done in creation and, uh, and redemption, uh, getting down on His knees and saying, please, turn ye, turn ye. Just do it. Do it. And that's what God is doing when He puts them in blackness. And the Bible says at the end of the chapter, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe! Woe! 
Woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound. You see, these are broken up into two parts as well. You had four horsemen and then you had a couple of plagues. But now what we have is we have woes coming. In these woes we will see in chapter 9 that God is going to take us from natural calamity, political stuff happening for three and a half years, and He's going to take us to supernatural calamity, blood and fire and smoke and death and wormwood and all of that, and He's going to take us to spiritual calamity because when people reject God, they necessarily must choose something else. They think they're worshiping themselves, but in reality, they're worshiping the devil. And the Bible tells us that they will eventually come to the place where they will actually, in this book it will tell us, they will worship the dragon, which is what the devil wanted all along. He said, I will be like the Most High. And in Revelation we find the devil finds purchase for the hearts of people. And in the next chapter we're going to see God giving a key to the bottomless pit. They're going to open that bottomless pit where demons are chained that are the worst of the worst demons that ever were. And he's going to let them loose on the earth again. Every movie that talks about aliens and every, uh, every conspiracy theory that talks about aliens, uh, they're going to get a wake-up call. It ain't aliens. It's fallen angels. And it's as if the devil is right now pressing against the cage <laughs> on every hand. UFOs and all the nonsense. They can't come yet because they haven't been given a green light. But boy, they're chomping at the bit. You can almost see them hitting that cage door like a gorilla angry. And when they get loosed, woe, woe, woe unto the earth. In other words, we ain't seen nothing yet. I want to read you a couple passages from the Old Testament. Isaiah 3, 13, 9 says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. And I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Joel says similar words, but ends with a better note for our purposes here today, because I want you to know the good news always comes on the heels of the bad news. Joel chapter 2 says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining, and the Lord shall utter His voice before His army. For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who, who can abide it? Therefore, also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he, is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? Aren't you glad there's always hope? Because this is serious business. And though we like to equivocate, we like to compare one with another, you know, I'm not as bad as this guy. God says, listen, one sin got him out of the garden. And you and I have got a whole host of those. One sin got him out of the garden. They couldn't see God anymore. We've been laying up all kinds of sins. God understood our mess. And He sent Jesus to come down and die the death that we deserve to die. To take the wrath that we deserve to endure. And whoever will call upon Him will not perish but have everlasting life.